It's like if you're selling a house and somebody lowballs you so much, it's an insulting offer and you should walk away. And I feel very strongly that that is the case for this trillion trees idea. You know, that is not real climate policy. Hello and welcome to another episode of Breakthrough Dialogues, the podcast for pragmatists and problem solvers brought to you by the Breakthrough Institute. I'm Alex Trembath, your host and deputy director here at Breakthrough. For this episode, I sat down with Leah Stokes. Leah is a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and author of the new book, Short Circuiting Policy, which is about climate policy and politics at the state level in, in the United States. Leah is, is one of the, the most interesting and considered observers of uh, climate policy, both at the state and federal level. And in particular, as we get into, has made something of a name for herself in observing, analyzing, breaking down the different climate plans of the Democrats currently running for Congress. As we record this episode, we are just off Super Tuesday. Elizabeth Warren has just dropped out of the presidential primary, and it's looking, as we get into, like former Vice President Joe Biden will be the nominee. And we talk about the different climate plans and the different climate visions that have led us into this pretty interesting new space in climate politics in the United States. Leah Stokes, welcome to Breakthrough Dialogues. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. So you're a professor at UC Santa Barbara. You have a new book coming out, Short Circuiting Policy, which we'll talk about a bit more later. And I think it's fair to say that you've made a bit of a name for yourself on Twitter as sort of one of the leading breakers down of or analysts of all of the presidential candidates' climate plans, uh, you know, in the Democratic presidential primary, you know, over the last year or so. Um, so that's a lot. I, I wanted to start yeah. by asking what you see your role and your goals in the climate and energy conversation as. Yeah, um, I think you're right. It's been a very strange year. Uh, I've been working on climate for 15 years, and uh, we know, those of us who've been doing this for a while, that the issue co goes through boom and bust cycles. I was doing it back in 2007 when An Inconvenient Truth came out and climate was really hot. And then when in 2009, we had the Waxman-Markey bill. So we seem to be in a boom cycle right now. And uh, that's really exciting because between 2009 and now, it was kind of a bust period. And we all just kept working away on the apocalypse and nobody really uh, paid much attention. So um, it's been exciting and different. And um, I guess I have spent the last 15 years just trying to learn everything I can about climate policy and politics. And part of my training, because I went to MIT for my PhD, uh, was working in engineering labs, in uh, atmospheric chemistry and science labs, and learning just some basic facts about the carbon cycle, um, energy systems, those kinds of things. So I think where I come in to the debate is sort of a lefty view on climate policy that is informed by the science and engineering uh, constraints on the system. So um, that's what I try to do. I try to advocate for climate action at the scale necessary that is smart. So for example, I've spoken out very forcefully recently against tree planting as a solution to climate change. And I got to say, some people on the left or people who run NGOs <laughs> doing tree planting don't really like me saying that. But I, I don't say things because you know, it'll get me followers or because I want some job and some government or because I don't know, whatever personal reason I say things that I believe are true because I think we need to understand the climate crisis in a truthful way. And even if it's not popular, um, I speak up. So that's kind of the way that I view what I'm doing. And I hope it's useful because all I really care about is trying to make a difference on carbon emissions. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you because I, I think I approach the issue from a sort of similar vantage. You know, we, I think you and I share a lot of the sort of positional uh, sort of policy views on things like tree planting or natural climate solutions mm -hmm. or technology inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you mentioned Inconvenient Truth, you mentioned Wax and Markey, and you mentioned this current period. The only other sort of punctuation point that I would add in, in that span is maybe the stuff around the Paris Agreement in 2015, oh, yeah. 2016, which I, I kind of is, agree is maybe less accentuated than those other periods. Um, do you think that we're moving in the right direction in terms of the policy discussion, in terms of the political discourse on climate? 
I think the last year has been a watershed year. I mean, you can't be living through Greta Thunberg and AOC and the Green New Deal and Jay Inslee and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and just all of it without thinking, wow, I mean, these are not ideas we were talking about 12 months ago. So that's really exciting um, because in my own work, looking at the state level, the states really are not on track to doing what they need to do. We've spent a decade writing newspaper stories and academic articles sort of touting cities and states as our saviors. And, you know, I can understand why people did that, because if we were going to look anywhere for action, it would have to be at the local and state level because the federal government was abdicating its responsibility entirely. But just because states and cities were doing things does not mean that they were doing enough or that even what they were doing was really being implemented at the full scale of its proposal. So that is what I take on in my book, Short Circuiting Policy. And um, it's been really exciting to see how much we could overcome some of those challenges if we could start to get federal action. And, you know, even this past week, um, there was a bill in uh, the Senate side in the committee that Murkowski and Manchin are in charge of um, that, you know, is not a perfect bill. and It's not even really a big climate bill, but it's an energy bill that has lots of interesting ideas in it. So, you know, you have to understand that we're in a Congress right now where pretty much nothing is happening. And the fact that we still have people trying to make progress on climate change right now, I mean, that is extremely hopeful for me. How do you see the the Green New Deal sort of fitting into all of that? Because I, again, share your sort of positive assessment of things like the Murkowski Mansion bill. You know, there are some other little things or sort of smaller ball things that have happened even since Trump was elected, like mm -hmm. the 45Q tax credit for carbon capture, you know, some work mm -hmm. on uh, nuclear innovation um, and yeah. efforts at the state level, sort of your your main focus in the book on not just um, sort of uh, renewable portfolio standards, uh, incentives for decarbonizing the uh, electricity sector, but things like clean energy standards that include mm -hmm. uh, that include things like carbon capture and nuclear. So, mm -hmm. you know, things have been happening. It, it, it might seem like it's all deadlocked, but there is at least some stuff happening behind the scenes. Um, the Green New Deal seems uh, both to maybe uh, envelop all of that, add to it, uh, crowd it out, depending on on sort of one's uh, political values, on, on one's perspectives. So what do you see as the role of the Green New Deal uh, as part of this discourse and part of the, the now movement we have around climate change? Well, I think that the Green New Deal is very exciting. Um, I think that it recognizes that we have to have solutions at the scale of the crisis. I've said this multiple times, but uh, you can't put a Band-Aid over an open artery. And a lot of what we've been doing with climate policy is tweaking at the edges of things and patting ourselves on the back for that. The problem is physics, the climate system, they don't care if we had a bipartisan bill that we half implemented that only got us to 25% clean energy. This is what we could describe as Texas, for example. Uh, you know, that's not enough. <laughs> we have to do more. So I'm really excited about that part of the Green New Deal. And, um, you know, I have a new research paper coming out probably a few weeks after this podcast comes out, it's already available online at SSRN. And what, what we look at is whether or not combining social and economic policy with climate policy increases public support for action, because that's what the Green New Deal is trying to do. And we show actually that it does. And even Republicans aren't really turned off by some of the ideas that people are talking about putting into a Green New Deal bill. Maybe certain businesses might not like those ideas, but the public at large, from a bipartisan perspective, uh, is on board with the ideas of what would go into a big climate package like a Green New Deal. And I think that's really exciting because a lot of what we've been doing for the past several decades is trying to pass a carbon price. And I'm, I won't say that I'm against a carbon price, but I think there are a lot of limitations of a carbon price. Uh, it's a regressive policy. Uh, it doesn't really reduce emissions at the speed that we need to when we do studies of carbon prices that have been put in place in other uh, jurisdictions. It does not lead to innovation. You can look at lots of research on that topic. And so uh, we need to have complementary policies if we want to pass a carbon price. And so 
I'm just really excited by passing a law that would um, increase equality in this country, that would address environmental justice, um, that would bring benefits to people and not just raise the costs of their electricity or raise the cost of filling up their gas powered cars. And, and personally, I feel like a solution that's more industrial policy focused where the government is paying to help people make the transition is likely to be more popular with the public, likely to be more sticky. We're not going to see the same kind of backlash that we might worry about if we just sort of hike up energy prices uh, when we're dealing with so much income inequality in this country and with a lot of energy insecurity. You know, one in three Americans struggle today to pay their energy bills. So I just think that uh, it's a really exciting proposal. And based on the research that I've done, I think it could be viable from a public perspective. On the one hand, you're preaching to the choir. You know, one of the founding <laughs> criticisms that the Breakthrough Institute made over a decade ago was of the sort of myopic focus on carbon pricing as mm -hmm. the sole or the or sort of the most important solution to climate change for a whole bunch of reasons that you just listed, and including maybe especially the point you just made about honestly, carbon pricing's pretty disappointing impact on energy innovation uh, mm -hmm. compared to what I think a lot of economists have to say about it. Um, and, you know, one of our one of our, again, sort of foundational views was that for climate action to be accelerated, for climate policy to be accelerated, it couldn't just be sort of regulatory technocracy um, or emissions mm -hmm. reductions as a special interest. You, you have to sort of tie climate action to things that people care about if you want to actually build political support and momentum towards accelerating innovation, accelerating deployment of clean energy technologies, things like that. Uh, so that you know, this this is something that really gels with our foundational views at the Breakthrough Institute. On the other hand, I am at least compelled by some of the specific criticisms of the Green New Deal itself. Um, you know that it's it's basically a progressive wish list, uh, including but uh, far outstripping just the interests uh, around climate change. We're talking about. Medicare for all. We're talking about universal basic income. We're talking about jobs guarantees. We're talking about green jobs. We're talking uh, about sort of massive environmental justice programs that these things mm -hmm. uh, might be debatable or have their own merits. But uh, if you try to package it all together, then it just becomes either sort of too heavy, too expansive to actually be implementable, um, or that it can cause a backlash of its own by, by sort of further polarizing climate politics. What is your mm -hmm. what is your reaction and what is your sort of uh, sense of that balance there? Well, I think those are all legitimate points. Um, you know, it was a big new idea, right? We never really thought about packaging social and economic policy at this scale with climate policy. Um, and I think we have to disentangle what the public view might be versus what elites and particularly interest groups might think about this. And my research on this topic right now is focused on the public. And at least amongst the public, uh, job guarantees, if you do polling on it, for a long time are pretty bipartisan. And we definitely find that in our own study. Uh, you know, increasing employment is not something that Republicans are against. And there are lots of things in this country that we will need to do if we really want to take climate change seriously. You can think of that as sort of the civilian climate core that people like uh, Jay Inslee have put forward. You know, it's, it's just an idea that we got a lot of work to do and let's find people and employ them to do that work. Uh, the same could be said for retraining programs for fossil fuel workers. You know, that has support um, across the spectrum. And it isn't something that turns off Republicans by any means. Um, you know, and I can understand why people feel that health care or some of these things are wish lists. But if we really understand climate change, we are talking about a huge transformation to our society. We have kind of siloed this topic as environmental policy, but it isn't really environmental policy. If if we really want to transform the way our energy system is, is run, our industry, our agriculture, our buildings, it's going to take an enormous amount of work and it's going to displace some industries that exist. So if we have social safety nets in place, then it makes it easier for people to transition. You know, even right now, people who are employed, they may not retire because uh, they can't get Medicare yet, or they may not go to a new job because they're worried about their insurance. So the way that our healthcare system really locks in the existing economic system, and that would be okay, except that we have to change the entire economic system because the entire economic system runs on fossil fuels. So at least from the public perspective, based on my research, I don't think that these ideas are uh, 
are terrible and would turn them off. There are some that are not bipartisan, um, like, for example, free college. That is not something that we see bipartisan support for. But there are other ideas that, you know, at least Republicans are not against. So people who are interested in that could check out my paper. Um, In terms of the interest group side of it, though, I think you're right. Uh, We are going to have a big fight over these issues. And um, the fact is that this is a sort of existential battle with a vested interest group. They um, have an enormous amount of sway in Congress, fossil fuel companies and electric utilities, and uh, beating them will not be easy. And you may be right that putting together a giant package like a Green New Deal is just going to be catnip for the fossil fuel industry. Um, But maybe what that means is that we get something else through uh, that we wouldn't have otherwise. Maybe even the Murkowski and Manchin bill that we're talking about is already an example of that. So, you know, when we when we think about negotiation, uh, you can anchor high, as we say, you can say, here's my ideal outcome. And I think we need to do that in the climate crisis because we actually have to solve the problem. But it it may be that over time, Republicans start to soften up and uh, stop being so polarized uh, on this issue. I don't think it's been driving polarization, the Green New Deal. I think what's been driving polarization is the fossil fuel industry and electric utilities uh, who have been primarying people like Bob Inglis, who are uh, Republicans willing to stick their neck out there and say, hey, I don't want to leave a damaged planet to my children and grandchildren. So I don't think it's a bad strategy. I don't know if we'll ever get a Green New Deal. I think that's a valid question and criticism, but um, I don't think it's causing harm. You mentioned Bob Inglis, who is a retired congressman who's been pushing for a carbon tax for a long time. Earlier in this season of this podcast, we talked to Carlos Corbello, another mm-hmm. former Republican congressman who's been making the case for climate action. And, you know, I would notice that just in the last few months, you have things like Republican Matt Getz's Green Real Deal for climate change. You have Kevin McCarthy, the minority leader in the House, um, a Republican who is also proposing a, a vision uh, in its own right, um, a Republican vision around climate action. Um, Mm -hmm. There's uh, a lot of different versions of it. I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are on the sort of many different types of policy agenda that Republicans are putting on offer now around climate change. I think that probably the Murkowski and Manchin bill uh, is is the high watermark that we've seen so far. Um, and Manchin, although he's a Democrat, uh, you know, there's some questions around that in terms of his energy policy and climate policy. Um, you know, some of the Republican proposals, uh, if we again think of this as a negotiation, you know, this is something that we should walk away from. It's like if you're selling a house and somebody lowballs you so much, it's an insulting offer and you should walk away. And I feel very strongly that that is the case for this trillion trees idea. You know, that is not real climate policy. And it's not because I don't like love trees. I have 34 fruit trees on my property. I love trees more than the next person. However, it is not a climate solution. A climate solution involves stopping burning fossil fuels and ideally removing historical fossil fuel combustion, CO2 in the atmosphere, and putting it back underground. That's how I view the problem because that is the physics of the problem. If all you do is you take carbon out of the atmosphere and you store it in trees, and then those trees, oh, I don't know, burn in a forest fire as has occurred in California and Australia to devastating effect over the past couple of years, uh, that carbon goes back up into the atmosphere. It goes back into the ocean. It does not solve the problem. So, um, I think we need real solutions that are at the scale of the crisis. And hey, if Republicans want to come to the table with a real carbon price uh, for the you know first time in a long time, well, hey, that would be an okay place to start. It's not my preferred policy, but it is a policy. And and maybe the negotiation takes off from there, where you then add a clean electricity standard. You know, you start to get back to more it's a more a more Waxman Markey package. Um, but I don't want there to be bills passed that are symbolic and toothless that allow Republicans to say, hey, we are tackling the climate crisis and give people a sense of false hope and that the the solution is solved. You know, we need the urgency that we have right now to put pressure on our elected officials to take this crisis seriously. And we cannot let them have fake wins with a tree planting bill. You've done more work than most people, uh, more work and more writing on the different climate plans that the Democratic Mm. presidential candidates are putting forward. Um, And I want to ask you what the 
what you think the epistemic value of these plans is. You know, recently, mm. Elizabeth Warren, who had not just one of the most detailed plans about climate change, but sort of the, many of the most detailed policy plans of all the candidates um, had to drop out of the primary due to lack of support after the Super Tuesday primaries. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also questions about sort of uh, you might have a detailed plan, um, but how different is it from any really from any of the other candidates plans separately? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You might have a very detailed and ambitious plan, but is it remotely implementable? Um, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. after doing quite a bit of thinking and writing about this um, and, and given where we are today uh, facing an uncertain general election in, in November um, and uh, uncertain support for different ideas in Congress. What do you think the value uh, for the sort of climate community in having, discussing, picking apart these plans is? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And it's obviously something I've thought about. And several people while I was doing this work uh, would say to me, well, you know, these these things are useless anyway. Why? Why do you care? They don't mean anything. Well, I don't take that nihilistic of a view. The primary is a time for the party to explore ideas, to, in fact, get people involved in the process. You know, these plans that different parties, uh, sorry, different uh, candidates have been putting out, they don't come from thin air. There are people involved in helping write them. Those are activists, they're academics, they're lawyers, there are people who used to work in the administration, there are campaign staff, they're all kinds of people. And um, that process brings together new people. They meet each other, they talk about ideas, they look at what's what's in Congress in terms of bills. You know, if you think about back to when Kamala Harris was running, uh, you know, her team was looking at some of the bills that she was writing, for example, with AOC in Congress at that time. So, you know, there's there's a lot of exchange with bills that are actually on the agenda in Congress. And it's a way of having a conversation about if we were to have power, if we were to take back the Senate, uh, what or if we were to have Republicans be reasonable and come to the table on climate, what would we actually want to do? And so that's that's the debate within the party, within the, the group of people working on the process. And I think that's extremely valuable. The next level of it is the journalists who are involved. A lot of journalists who work on climate change or don't at all work on climate change, um, you know, getting into the level of detail is is challenging for any of us. And so, you know, creating a seven hour Climate Town Hall, for example, was an insane education opportunity for a lot of journalists. They were assigned to watch this thing unfold, and suddenly they learned more about climate change than they had ever learned before. So um, I think that that is a really valuable thing that the um, primary has done. And, and I'm really happy about people like um, Jay Inslee, Tom Steyer, and even to some extent, Mike Bloomberg, who ran because they wanted to elevate the issue of climate change. And definitely for Jay Inslee, he succeeded in doing that. Um, so I think that's another valuable component. And look, it is true. The public is not paying attention to the details between the plans. You'll see that more climate voters voted for Biden than, uh, than anybody else, if you look at the exit polls. Um, but I do feel like as a community, we should be having conversations about whether or not Bernie Sanders' position on um, nuclear license renewals is okay. You know, I think that's a great conversation to be having. I think we should be having a conversation about how we're going to build out renewables at the speed and scale possible, uh, sorry, at the speed and scale necessary. You know, is it going to be through power marketing authorities like Bernie Sanders has been talking about? Is it going to be um, more through existing um, private companies? Uh, are we going to have grants? Are we going to do tax credits? And how are we going to get existing fossil fuel infrastructure turned off? You know, uh, what are we going to do with rural electric co-ops? The Inslee plan, for example, which is 200 pages. I mean, there's so much brilliant thinking in there. And for anybody who's going to go into government in the next administration or for people on the outside pushing ideas and think tanks or NGOs, that's a gold mine, and that work is very valuable. And I say the same thing for Elizabeth Warren's campaign. I mean, they wrote 14 climate plans, including dropping one on Sunday of this week, um, right before she dropped out. And uh, the last plan they came up with was very interesting. It was about um, how can we get Wall Street to stop bankrolling uh, continuing fossil fuel investments. That's a really important question and issue. And they had lots of interesting legislative ideas for how to do that. So, you know, 
primaries are cool, apart from stressing us all out, which that's not cool. Um, but from an ideas perspective, it's really been invaluable. And just because the public doesn't pay attention to all the conversations that we're having, I know that I can say that I have learned so much uh, during this primary. And I know that other people who are open-minded and who want to look into the details and talk to campaigns and talk to journalists, they're in the same boat that I am in. And that is all positive. Yeah. Yeah. One of the reasons I asked is because there is, I don't know if it's a tension or a trade-off, but there is this difference between communicating big ideas like the Green New Deal and filling those ideas in with very mm -hmm. detailed policy agendas. Obviously, some policies will have to pass for there to be an impact eventually. But I'm just like very, very interested in what resonates politically. As you said, sort of uh, more people who listed climate as their main concern voted for Joe Biden than anybody else in the last uh, in the last couple of weeks of the Democratic primary. Uh, Biden, who I think is generally perceived to have one of the less fleshed out uh, climate plans uh, of all the candidates. Um, on the other hand, uh, Joe Biden lists a Green New Deal uh, mm -hmm. a, as something he supports on his website. He talks uh, about ambitious climate targets. He talks about a focus mm -hmm. on justice in the, in the way the Green New Deal um, is structured to do. And, and mm -hmm. yet, like, the, the Sunrise Movement um, and other uh, and other sort of climate progressives are still pretty down, I think, on on Biden and his climate plan. Um, so I'm just you don't say. Yeah, as, as they as they like on the one hand, they should be like, you know, there should be in uh, in uh, in most ways sort of a, a radical flank, a left flank um, on, on the left, at least, you know, you sort of want mm -hmm. the, the, the really ambitious side to be pushing um, uh, to some degree. Um, uh, how do you what do you make of all of that, though? You know, we've we've got we're sort of uh, narrowing in on a likely candidate. I think I think the 538 model has a seven and eight chance of, of Biden getting the nomination at this point. Um, we, yes. He is talking about a Green New Deal. Um, and yet there are so, there are some folks who are still pretty disappointed in that. You know, so where, where do you land on all of that at at least this stage in the in the election? Yeah, Um you know, I think a lot of people really wanted to elect Bernie Sanders within the climate movement. Not everybody. I can say that for sure. It, the movement, uh, there was many people who wanted to elect Elizabeth Warren. Uh, you know, a lot of people were supporting other candidates early and later in the race, like Tom Steyer, uh, Jay Inslee, even some people like Bloomberg. So, you know, there have been many candidates. And, you know, for all the hating on Pete Buttigieg, he did not have a bad climate plan. I mean, there were lots of good ideas in there and he had smart people advising him. Um, so, you know, I think it's been good that there has been pressure to elevate this issue. I think that the calls for a climate debate have been really excellent. Um, I think that sometimes some of the detail gets lost and that, for example, in the case of Pete Buttigieg, that people say, oh, his plan isn't good when Every time I would go back to Pete Buttigieg's plan, I'd be like, oh, this is this is pretty good because <laughs> I'd be hearing all these negative things about him. And then I would remind myself if I actually looked at the details, there were lots of good ideas there. And similarly, you know, I have said since the very beginning that I have problems with Bernie Sanders' climate plan. And that's not popular to say among the left, um, but I just do. I think that uh, you know, if you put $16 trillion on the table and you don't put a single dollar for direct air capture or any negative emissions technologies beyond tree planting, that is a problem. I think that if you say we're going to not give license extensions for nuclear energy when it supplies uh, more than 50% of our clean power today, um, and there are license extension applications from Duke right now, you know, that's a problem because you might hope and dream and wish and pray that renewables are going to grow fast enough. But what if they don't and you end up keeping an open fossil fuel infrastructure longer than than uh, nuclear, which is what has happened in, oh, I don't know, Germany, Japan, Vermont, California. We've learned that lesson. And, and I just don't want to learn that lesson for the entire United States is is far too dangerous to do that again. So, you know, I think I've had issues there. And um a lot of people 
might share my views actually on some of those things, but not want to criticize Bernie. And I get that because they really want him to win. And maybe for other reasons, uh, or maybe because even though he doesn't have a perfect plan, he talks about climate change more than other candidates. He's very forceful. And, and I think there's a feeling that he would prioritize it. So there's some qualitative stuff that people have around why they might like a particular candidate. And, you know, I get that because I felt that way about Elizabeth Warren. You know, I wanted a woman and I, um, really liked her. So I get why people might feel that way about Bernie Sanders. My view at this point with Joe Biden is that uh, we have to make him the climate champion we need. There is no choice. If he's going to win, we need him to be great. And if the movement is powerful and we have good ideas, uh, we should be able to do that. And I don't think that there should be any shame in talking to Joe Biden campaign people or starting to um, think about how we can make him a better climate uh, candidate. Because the only candidate, as my friend said to me today, the only candidate who's running for president who should get an F for their climate plan is Donald Trump. That is the reality. You know, we are going to have to win an election in November to get a climate denier out of the White House. And, you know, when you're running for president, it's a figurehead. Ultimately, there's going to be a person who's be president and there's lots of reasons to want one figurehead over another. But it's a question of who is the team around them. And I think now is the moment to say to the Biden campaign, look, this is an issue that's really important for young people. Uh, this is an issue um, that uh, is really important to the progressive left. You've got to bring those parts of the party into your tent and becoming more aggressive on this issue is the morally right thing to do. And it's also advantageous in terms of making sure that we can have excitement behind you. So I think Joe Biden is going to become the climate champion we need because uh, there's no choice. And so uh, I support that outcome. And if Bernie Sanders pulls off a Hail Mary and as president, I guess I'll eat my words. But um, it seems unlikely, as you mentioned. And so the climate movement has to get smart and uh, start making Joe Biden the climate champion we need. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about this book that you've got coming out, um, short, short Circuiting Policy. Why did you decide uh, to write a book? What does it say? And what did you learn along the way? Why did I decide to write a book? I asked myself that question a hundred times <laughs> while I was writing the book. Um, it was a long process. I think it was like seven years to write a book, which is often how long it takes when you write an academic book. Um, you know, I was very interested in renewable portfolio standards, what, what are now becoming clean electricity standards. Uh, why they got passed, how they got implemented across the country. This is probably the most important policy we have at the subnational level for really making a dent in the climate problem over the last several decades. So I learned an enormous amount about that. Um, and that's what's a, that, that is what the book is about. It's about state level clean energy and climate action. Uh, and it, it's actually about the ways that the fossil fuel industry and electric utilities have slowed down progress in the states. If you pick up the New York Times or whatever newspaper is actually writing about climate change, you'll sometimes find stories about how the states and cities are going to save us. And I really question that in this book. I show the ways that Ohio, for example, is bailing out coal plants and keeping them open until 2040 when these plants are like 80 years old. And they're doing that to the tune of like five billion dollars in support. Uh, I show how in Arizona, a utility, Arizona Public Service, has spent more than 50 million dollars capturing their regulator and rolling back clean electricity in that state, uh, really trying to delay the clean energy transition. You know, Arizona Public Service is consistently saying, let's build all these new natural gas plants. And they are trying to block solar being built in Arizona, what you might imagine is a very sunny place. Um, so I talk a lot about the tactics that electric utilities and fossil fuel companies have been using to delay progress. And then ultimately, I try to reverse engineer that playbook so that climate advocates and clean energy advocates uh, can make more progress. So I think for people interested in understanding the clean energy transition, what's been happening at the states, how much faster we need to be moving, and, and hearing some really fascinating stories about what's going on in Texas, uh, Kansas, Arizona, Ohio, California, um, you know, you can pick up a copy of the book. And um, I think you'll, uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot in the process. I certainly learned so much. The one benefit of writing a book is that you learn a lot and all those facts stick in your head. Um, so, you know, I feel that I understand how far how far behind we are on the problem uh, because I read, wrote this book. 
definitely look the book up. It's called Short Circuiting Policy. Uh, congratulations again. And Leah Stokes, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. It's always great to talk with you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to Breakthrough Dialogues. If you like our show, tell your friends, rate us, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or whatever platform you get your podcasts on. I want to once more thank my guest, Leah Stokes, and our producers, Alyssa Kadaman and Tali Perlman. Catch you next time.